I wanted to um, begin this session with uh, two poems by Billy Collins, who was the poet laureate of the U.S. in uh, 2002. And the first poem for me uh, really exemplifies the feeling that I was talking about this morning, about deep nourishment from ordinary things. That's before we got into the hard questions (laughs) that we were dealing with. But that um, our lives awaken as Trumpa Rinpoche said, through ordinary magic. It's in the everyday things that the miraculous happens for most of us. And it's developing that incredible sensibility that allows us to perceive the subtle. And to perceive the subtle requires us to really slow down and not to be so bombarded through the kind of sensory experience that typifies our lives. I'm going to change a few of the words so we're in Maui. This morning, as I walked along the ocean's shore... I fell in love with a wren and later in the day with a mouse. The cat had dropped underneath the dining room table. In the shadows of an autumn evening, I fell for a seamstress, still at her machine in the tailor's window, and later for a bowl of broth steam rising like smoke from a naval battle. This is the best kind of love, I thought. Without recompense, without gifts or unkind words, without suspicion or silence on the telephone, the love of the chestnut, the jazz cap, and one hand on the wheel. No lust, no slam of the door. The love of the miniature orange tree, the clean white shirt, the hot evening shower, the highway that cuts across Florida. No huffiness, no waiting, no rancor, just a twinge every now and then for the wren who built her nest on a low branch overhanging the water and for the dead mouse still dressed in its light brown suit. My heart is always propped up in a field on its tripod, ready for the next arrow. (laughs) Ain't it the truth? I mean, (sighs) after I carried the mouse by its tail, to a pile of leaves in the woods, I found myself standing at the bathroom sink, gazing down affectionately at the soap. (laughs) So patient and soluble, So at home in its pale green dish, I could feel myself falling again 
as I felt its turning in my wet hands and caught the scent of lavender and stone. Oh. Billy Collins. Billy Collins. So, Love. Hmm. Is that how do you do that? Yum 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 yum. <laughs> yum 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 yum. Yum yum yum. Let's hear it. Yum 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 yum. Yum yum. Yum yum. Yum. Rom rom. Oh. The secret is love. To surround a dying person with love. With love. That love permeates presence. I used to say, I am awareness. Awareness. And then I added one thing. I am loving awareness. Loving awareness. I am loving awareness. And before we love, that we've got to, uh, we've got to love this. We have to love unconditionally ourselves. Maharaji turned my life around by Unconditional love. He loved me. He loved me. And that's for some time for since I've known Maharaji. I have unconditionally loved. Coming from a family of lawyers, I judged before and now I love because judging gets you to the power position love gets you into the middle of into the middle of the stew Once you find you you are a lovable, then it's a minor step to the
the world to the world is lovable. Just going to. You're going to do the soul thing? Yep, soul thing. <laughs> I'm in a Buddhist temple and I get a Buddhist partner, and all I can do is tell you the soul. They don't believe in souls. You know that, i sure. Well, let's just see how it works okay. out. I- <laughs> But can I read a poem first? Yeah. (laughs) It's a soulful poem. (laughs) (laughs) And this is a poem is by uh, a German poet named Liesel Müller. And it's about love too and the soul. And it's called Monet refuses the operation. Doctor, you say there are no halos around the streetlights in Paris, and what I see is an aberration caused by old age and affliction. I tell you, it has taken me my whole life to see a vision of gas lamps as angels, to soften and blur and finally banish the edges you regret I don't see, to learn that the line I called the horizon does not exist, and sky and water so long apart are the same state of being. Fifty-four years before I could see Rouen Cathedral is built of parallel shafts of sun. And now you want me to restore my youthful errors? Fixed notions of top and bottom? The illusion of three-dimensional space, wisteria separate from the bridge it covers. What can I say to convince you? The houses of parliament dissolve night after night to become the fluid dream of the Thames. I will not return to a universe of objects that do not know each other. As if islands were not the lost children of one great continent. The world is flux and light becomes what it touches, becomes water, lilies on water, becomes lilac and mauve and yellow, small fists of sunlight passing so quickly one to the other that it would take the long streaming streaming hair inside my brush to catch it to paint the speed of light. Our weighted shapes, these verticals, burn to mix with air and change our bones, skin, and clothes to gases. Our weighted shapes, these verticals, burn to mix with air and change our bones, skin, and clothes to gases. Doctor, 
If you could only see how heaven pulls earth into its arms and how infinitely the heart expands to claim the world. Blue vapor without end. The soul. Oh. I'm, I'm being in the soul. <laughs> Ever since I experimented in consciousness through psychedelics I I have become aware of different planes of consciousness just as that was planes of consciousness and this would this panorama of people at one pl- plane I can see men and women and colors and things like that and another plane I can see energy And I can see, I can see beings who have come to this plane and are caught in, in their incarnations. Souls. Let's for a minute just shift planes. You can you you your plane here now is ego plane. You If you define yourself as roles, that's the ego plan. And there's this other plane at which we have identity. the soul plane and then there is a further out plane there is the one and then this further out plane that you toy with You, your ego is a thought. It's a thought. And, and you are who you think you are. That's who you are most of the time. But just behind that, is the soul. And the soul goes from incarnation to incarnation to incarnation. 
and it came to this incarnation. You got slapped on the butt and everybody said coo coo and hello baby. That was your introduction to the to this play. And the mother thought she was a mother. And the father thought he was a father. And the doctor thought he was a doctor. (laughs) And the nurse thought she was a nurse. And they weren't going to let me, when I took birth, get away with being all of everything. So I became Richard. And I was a good Richard. And I thought I was Richard. That's what I thought I was. Richard. 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 <laughs> Richard. That was always that was always that the Richard. <laughs> and the fact that I was a soul that came down to this plane was it 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 meant nothing to me at all. I was busy fulfilling my identity in the this incarnation. And my mother and my father and teachers and they all thought the incarnation was real. And I got, I bought, I bought into it. I bought into it. Although I was somebody entirely different. And then (coughs) mushrooms came along. And my mushroom experience was that I was in a darkened room and far of far in the, there was a person there. It was it was me. It was my my roles. I was sitting and there was the person and I said Oh, I hope this drug isn't going to take away all my identities. And there was Professor. The minute I see one, it would turn. There was an airplane pilot. There was a lover, a, a sexual lover. And then there was each one of my roles just as up there. And there was Richard was over there. And I thought this this psychedelic is going to make me forget who I am. I can't give up Richard. I'm going to have amnesia. 
And then I thought, well, I le- still I have my body. And I looked down at the couch I was sitting on. And the couch was, the, there was a couch, but there was no body on it. And I, 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 with the eyes open, my body wasn't there. And I was, why I was going to call my guide. I was get, I was frightened. I had no body. And I was going to call, help, help. When I suddenly. The thought, uh, who's going to call? All the roles are gone, the the body gone, who's going to call? Who's minding the store? And for the first time, I met that inside being and all my psychology studies had never taught me that inside being and I was teaching clinical and yeah 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 I was getting to know my soul. And I jumped up and I ran out in the snow. It was snowed that night in Boston, Newton. And um, I rolled in the snow. I was just in such ecstasy. And um, the house I was staying in, uh, it was two blocks from my parents' home. And I walked through the snow. I was going to say hello to them. And um, their walk wasn't Troubled, of course. None of the walks were so. So I went to the garage and got the shovel. And I was shoveling this in a walk, which I felt, I felt in my soul that was a good thing for the young buck should do <laughs> to, 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 for the old folks. And their their images were in the window with with they were they were peeved peeved they were angry because I was shoveling snow. So I looked up at them, and I inside this inside perfect, perfectly fine to shovel snow. You see, the key was it was three in the morning, <laughs> and nobody shovels snow at three in the morning. That's the rule of the game. And I knew it was, I wasn't, I was shoveling snow. I was shoveling for the old people. And it was perfectly okay. 
and I looked at them and I danced around the shovel <laughs> did a jig around the shovel and they waved at them and uh, went to shoveling snow that was the first time in my life I had ab- I had resisted authority I had never resisted authority even up until then parents teachers uh, professors um, my job uh, and I I felt for the first time in my in my uh, in my heart of hearts I had a true um, A true being. This is ne- it never happened after psychoanalysis and teaching therapy and uh, all this crap. <laughs> after that, it didn't work to, to be to get that. And and I the, 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 the this thing in me had it had love for everything around it, love for everything around it. And I went to teach at Harvard the next day. But everything I'm teaching is stale. Is stale. It was ego psychology. Ego psychology. And this thing that I met inside myself it was real it was so real that it put my life into unreality And from that point on, I read mystical books. I read religious religion. I read And the thing is, I looked at everybody just as I look at you. I looked at them as souls. It's like going into a grocery store and it's like a temple because it's just souls. Some of them think they're customers and some of them think they're clerks and that's their roles. But I see who they are. 
I see that there are souls who have 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 been seduced by their incarnations. And so to India. In the village I went to India they their identity was though that of souls and they played their roles they played their roles one one man was the sweeper and one man was the king and they played their roles with with humor and with with uh, lightness, lightness, lightness. And the sweeper said, thought he could, if he, if he uh, played his soul game good enough, The next time, he will be another kind of a soul. And the, the, and the king thought the same thing. So when I met Maharaji, he reflected, he he mirrored my soul. He mirrored my soul. So that I, when I was with him, I was in love. I was in love. Larry Brilliant, who's a friend of mine, who's a, a, a doctor, and uh, he met Maharaji. And um, he said, Maharaji's a saint. He can, he wonderful. He can, he can love everybody. But he said, when I get, when I am in in the space around Maharaji." I love everybody. He says, "I, I'm not, I never accept. I never, I never that. I never." He said, "Why should, why should I love everybody? I'm no saint." But Maharaji mirrored the soul of Larry. So if you can see your ego is in your incarnation that if your ego free birth if your 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 identity as ego is going to be feared of death. Your your identity with your soul 
you've, di you've died and you've died and you've died. You've died hundreds of times. How much are you going to get worked up over this one? And when somebody like me is with somebody that is dying, I can see this, the, the ego going bye-bye and then the, the soul taking over. And when I meet somebody who, whose partner has died, I say to them, if you identify with your soul, the way in which you two were in love, soul to soul, Will, will be renewed, and you will meet your 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 lover. Because death is just a moment for the soul. Another moment. Another moment. Now, the soul has, going through all these incarnations, has there's an end to it all. The, the soul isn't motivated, but is there is an end to it. And the soul finally gets to the end of his of its in, uh, is his karma. And when the end of the karma occurs, the soul merges with the one. <coughs> merges with the trees, with the ocean, with all of it. Going from ego to soul, from identity to identity, is separate beings, and that those separate beings merge into the total being, the total soul, the total God the total Brahma, the total emptiness. For you to enter into the into the 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 death process you can't step you can't identify with your ego you can only identify with your soul
because you you can't go you can't be present for the entire ceremony And that's why the those of us that understand this understand that we train ourselves to identify with our spiritual being. Because birth and death are we've got to be ready to to be able to step out of the box and so uh, This process, we are, we are together here to carry out. It's a process of transformation for each of us. You came here an ego. And you're f faltering such uh, now. And you're s not quite that ego. Some of these, some of these exercises and some, some of the things that Joan has. I guess what we I'm saying is your sadhana works. Your 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 spiritual preparation. works and it makes you a spiritual being Maharaji said to me, Ramdas, love everybody. And I said, I can't do that. And he said, nose to nose, he came up with it. Ramdas, love everybody. And tell the truth. And I had a fight with some people that in this temple. And I said, I said to him, I hate those people. I thought I told you to love everybody. I said, but you told me to, to tell the truth. <laughs> And he came up nose to nose and he said, love everybody and tell the truth. And he, he was instructing me to 
become my soul. Because the, the souls are, they meet in love. They meet in love. They meet in love. And I, and he lets me see that I am not a soul when I'm, when I'm angry or when I'm, when I'm other than in love. You know, we we stay love as if we're saying hate or something, some other emotional thing. And love is a coming from the soul. And and all these other things are coming from the from the mind. Fellow souls. <laughs> Fellow souls. Mm. Uh, it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I want you to comment. <laughs> when um, Artie talks, I feel like he's talking oh. from uh, a place that is so precious and deep that one can't really comment on it, um, except I would like to. (laughs) (laughs) At one time, Ram Dass and I were doing something at Omega, and um, he went on this sort of soul trip where he talked about this level and that level, and you went through this stage and that stage, and... Yeah, I, he was so absolutely convincing. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> See, this is our problem. So, um, you know, we did our usual thing, which was to have a little spat in public. <laughs> But actually, as he's speaking today, I can say uh, from my own experience in practice, in meditation practice, that for me, that which he's referring to um, is what I, as a Buddhist practitioner, would call Buddha nature, or my awakened nature, my most unconditioned nature. And then, because I can't remember my last incarnation, though I, when I took those visionary substances. Um, you know, I had really fantastically fascinating experiences where I was convinced I was, you know, various things in past lives. But I've gotten into a place in my practice where in the... Um, the deepest state that I've realized has uh, nothing fancy about it. But it's all, I mean, it's all extraordinary. And it is that state about which I think Ramdas's teacher and others, they know that when you look into somebody as we did in the exercise yesterday, you're looking from a place that is unjudgmental, unconditioned, therefore loving. You're looking from your unconditioned nature, 
Dogen calls it body and mind dropping away. And there are tastes of that in one's life, throughout one's life. We all know it. There was a moment this afternoon when I was down at the beach, just a kind of flash where I could see through this cerulean water and the wave was inside of me. I really felt washed by it. Now, as to the vision that is prevalent in um, Tibetan Buddhism particularly, sometimes referenced in the Pali Canon of something reincarnating, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know if the accumulation of punya, of merit in this life is going to earn me a better life in my next incarnation or whether it's just a Hindu incentive program to keep (laughs) villagers in their place. (laughs) I don't know. But I imagine if it's true, I say inside of myself, I want to live then as a Buddha would live. Because since I can't really say it's yes, that's the way it is, or no, that's the way it isn't, because I don't think that science can empirically prove, etc., in spite of Ian Stevenson's work on 20 reincarnations and many more, I'm, you know, it's still a little dicey. But that doesn't mean that my absence of conviction in something that I feel could be can't be verified empirically. If I have even the slightest notion of this being possible, then why not live as if it is? But this is a woman's approach to things. You know, I tend to be really practical. So um, the idea of uh, knowing and convictions uh, has become less and less interesting to me as I've gotten older. Maybe when I'm as old as you are, I'll have a renewed set of convictions. (laughs) But I always feel like convictions convict you, and they send you into a conceptual or prison of faith. And um, so, you know, I kind of live inside of my own heart in a secret place that is basically about not knowing. And the Chinese patriarchs characterized it in many ways. And yesterday I used one of the phrases, not knowing is most intimate. And it is exactly, for me, that quality which allows for love and intimacy and play and surprise. I was just with Brother David. I did a fundraiser for him in New York, I mean San Francisco, And um, we were sitting on the stage of the Hepst Theater. It's a beautiful old theater built during the 1930s. And someone asked the question, what is the sort of main characteristic of gratefulness? And Brother David said, surprise. So it is this kind of feeling I can really relate to surprise. It's just, it's just this kind of feeling of being very alive to life, or like Dogen said, giving life to life, and like this, the wow of Maui. <laughs> the sort of, ah, oh, that wakefulness. And whether or not the subtle mind reincarnates according to the virtue of one's past life, um, again, it's not a frame of reference that even though I as a Buddha should believe in, I'm not a belief kind of person. But I can relate from my own experience of the tremendous value of having a practice that opens up the doors and windows of your house so you can see, really, and then the house kind of disappears one day. (laughs) It's like, suddenly it's gone. And then it flops around you again like... But in the dying process, um, 
the heavier your house is, the more ramified, the greater the castle, the bigger the acreage, unless your house is the whole universe, um, you're going to have an interesting journey abandoning your house. And one of the things, the precipitants that um, really One of the things that is very um, uh, difficult for a person like me to come to terms with um, has to do with a, a question that dying people and their families face all of the time. And that is, should an intervention happen now? Should I do everything possible to um, lengthen my life? I mean, you know, we're all taking vitamins, you know, we're on the beach doing our thing. I should have a little ozone box for my airplane experience tonight. (laughs) Oh, I made the reservation. Um, Or should I let things take their natural course, irregardless of um, how complicated my experience might be physically or even cognitively? You know, it's not just about being bummed out when you're dying. You know, being depressed, experiencing anticipatory grief, being angry, uh, being in a state of sort of um, uh, manic denial, <laughs> whatever whatever it is that you might be experiencing, uh, there are often cognitive changes that dying people go through which are really out there. I mean, really unusual. So should I hasten my death, I ask? And in a world where we seem to have less and less control over our destinies, um, suicide seems like a pretty good option in terms of taking, putting my hand on the tiller. That's what you hear from many dying people. When I was working intensively with men dying of AIDS, um, there were very interesting values. You know, one value was um, I've lost control of my body. I've lost control of my relationships. I'm losing control of my life, but I will not lose control of my death. This is the one place where I can exercise control and I'm going to choose the time and place of my demise. So that is one avenue. So one of the things that Ram Dass and I wanted to um, have us explore, though I think we should have a bathroom break. Isn't that right? Yeah. Um, it's, an, it's another gnarly subject. It's kind of hard to get into at this late hour, but I, I think it's important that we do. It's a piece that the inquiry's got to happen. So I'd like to call for a really quick bathroom break, um, and then we need to be back here in this room at 4 o'clock. So hurry, hurry.